what I was thinking of doing, and this will be a shortish presentation, because then we can actually maybe get some discussion going and see how all these different things come together. But what I was thinking of doing is giving you a short presentation, which I'm going to push the terms of memory into new boundaries, into new areas. Memory studies, there's a lot of memory studies. It became a huge field. Um, a couple of years ago, a memory studies association was founded. It started out of a meeting in Amsterdam two years ago. And last year, they had their second meeting in Copenhagen, and it was massive. People came from all over in many different kind of areas. The next one is, uh, is in Spain, I think, this summer. And, and again, this is it's bourgeois, it's huge. So this has been kind of fermenting for a long time, and now it's exploding everywhere. People already began historicizing it or socializing it. They are talking about the, the, the third wave or the second wave of the memory boom. There's already terms for all this stuff. But it's, it's a very happening topic. And the problem with a very happening topic is people pull it in lots of directions. And also, we tend to be repetitive. We keep repeating the same terms. We kind of accept certain things as axioms. And I'd like us to challenge some of these and think. All right. So what I, I'm going to refer to material coming out of this book or pertaining to this book. And I'll give an example from this book because the date that I'm here, which connects to the book, but I, I'd like to present something much bigger, and not only related to Ireland per se, Northern Ireland or to Ireland. Um, and I'd also, I've been trying to push memory studies, which I think it's actually happening now, in the direction of forgetting. That I talked about a bit yesterday during the launch, and the whole book can explain that, and for those who want to see the more general aspect of it, you can read. Each chapter here is pretty hefty, but the first chapter deals very generally with these kind of fields. And later on, for those who want to see comparative examples, you can skip to the very end and you'll see other kind of contexts within Europe, at least. I limited it to Europe, the last comparative chapter. But I'm going to deal here with theory. And my goal is going to be to try and explain what might seem very strange and paradoxical theoretical terms, but I actually think that they're very simple. It's a bit related. I was thinking about yesterday the conversation I had with Liam just last night as we walked out. Liam said, OK, it's very nice that we have these big concepts. You can't bring them to a public. Or how do you bring it to a public? So I'm kind of thinking about that, and we, we are a public. None of us have been exposed to these ideas, so let's give it a try. Um, let's start, actually, with the metaphor level, Brian. I think that'll be interesting. With history and memory through the looking glass. And it's part of my thinking, which has been ongoing for a good part of my whole shortish academic career, but since my PhD, I've been thinking all the time, when does memory begin and when does memory end? What is the lifespan? What is the biography? It's a term we use a lot now in history, biography. Um, and the image, of course. She made classic images of Tenniel, of Alice through the looking glass. But Alice through the looking glass is actually an interesting source. It's way beyond. That's why I'm happy that there's an author in the room, because actually literature often precedes definitely history and often quite a lot of theory. So let's actually read a section from Alice through the looking glass. For those who don't remember it, we tend to think of it as a children's book. We don't go back to it. Go back to it. It's a deep book. Well, any mathematician will tell you it's a deep book, but there's much beyond that. So let's read this little section here together, if we may. This is Alice and the Queen meeting, right? This is Alice. It's the second book. It's not the same Queen quite exactly. I don't understand you, said Alice. It's dreadfully confusing. That's the effect of living backwards, the Queen said kindly. It always makes one a little giddy at first. Living backwards? Alice repeated in great astonishment. I never heard of such a thing. But there's one great advantage in it. That one's memory works both ways. I've highlighted that line. It's a puzzle which has been troubling me. I'm sure mine only works one way, Alice remarked. I can't remember things before they happen. It's a poor sort of memory that only works backwards, the Queen remarked. What sort of things do you remember best, Alice ventured to ask. Oh, things that happened the week after next, the Queen replied in a careless tone. For instance, now, she went on, sticking a large piece of plaster on her finger as she spoke. There's the King's messenger. He's in prison now, being punished. And the trial doesn't even begin till next Wednesday. And of course, the crime comes last of all. Suppose he never commits the crime, said Alice. That would be all the better, wouldn't it, the Queen said, as she bound the plaster around her finger with a bit of ribbon. Alice felt there was no denying that. Of course it would be all the better, she said. But it wouldn't be all the better his being punished. So what does it mean remembering something that hasn't happened? It seems very paradoxical, very whimsical. So we have here Lewis Carroll's the kind of thing we'd expect from Alice. I think there's more to that than Alice. So what we're going to do here, well, we'll start, that's the quote. One's, the two bits here which I focus on would be one's memory works both ways, and it's a poor, it's a poor, this went out here, and it's a poor sort of memory that only works backwards, or we can find it in other places. It's a quote that's also been haunting me for years from Paul Valéry. Uh, we move into the future backwards. What does that mean, to move into the future? And if people think this is only very sophisticated, either Victorian or 20th century uh, literature, well, here we go back into tradition. I always like using repositories of tradition. 
often quoted, you find sometimes by New Zealand politicians, sometimes by New Zealand cultural f uh, uh, figures, this Maori proverb, which also means walking backwards into the future. So what does it mean, walking backwards into the future? And that's what I'm going to try and uh, look at a bit now. And to do that, we have to roll ourselves back. We have to get into Alice before she gets into the looking glass. Let's look at where we are now, before you go into very strange terrain. This is the obvious, I think, or the common sense. Obvious and common sense are two different things. We're going to play with common sense. It seems quite obvious, isn't it? First, there's history in terms of what happened. There's the events that happened. And then there's memory. We remember those events. And then as time goes by, there's forgetting. We forget those events. Isn't that the way it works? Things happen. We remember them. After a long time, we forget them. That all makes sense. Now we're going to go through the looking glass. It's going to get very weird from now, all right? So let's wait for the weirdness, and I'll try and show you that weirdness is we're used to dealing with weirdness. It's not just authors and strange tribes in New Zealand, but it's actually we're all dealing with this all the time. We just don't articulate it necessarily. But let's look at this. So let's pull her through the looking glass, and let's put a question mark on that. And the first thing I'm going to do is this. I'm going to move memory over here. I'm going to ask, is it possible that we remember an event before it happens? Is there such a thing as pre-memory? Now, I've been writing about this in different forms in different places for a while now. I've been thinking about it for a good while. And there's different forms of defining what I mean by pre-memory. But I'll try and show you one very concrete case from this book to explain it. But the workshop part will be, I'm preparing you already in advance now so you can jot down notes. Um, I want you to think, if you can think of any examples from your own area, and from your own topics that you're thinking of, can this be applied to your own? That's a discussion I'd like us to have. Rather than me providing you with lots of examples, and I can think of a few, but actually decided this morning to go through a mental exercise which relates to another theme of the book. I tried to disremember all my examples this morning and say, I'm not going to bring these things. I don't, I don't even want to remember them when I'm sitting here. I'm going to focus just on this so that we'll see what I can pull, what we can get out collectively, and if we think if anything can be relevant in any way to your work, and push yourself. Not that you're going to do something with it, but just say, could this be? Let's discuss it collectively. All right? So the first notion is, what does it mean to deal with memory before history? And even then, I'd say, it really is pushing it. Because the more we think about it, we realize that it's not necessarily that history happens and then memory, but the two kind of at the same time are happening. As events are happening, we're already kind of thinking how we're going to remember them, and already the memory is being constructed from the time itself. That can make sense. That's something that's been acknowledged both in anthropology and in history in different cases. A great historian, David Fitzpatrick, has written about it, even in the case of 1916 and the Irish Revolution, saying as it's happening, people are staging what they're happening for posterity. They're trying to have it remembered as it's happening. It calls it instant history. Um, it's an event that we were at together, I believe, John, quite a, a couple of years ago, that Fergal pulled together and he, he presented that. But I'm going to say before that. Even before that, I'm going to think, what does it mean before that? I'll try and explain what I mean in a minute. I'm leaving you with a puzzle, the conundrum at the moment. The moment I'm just trying to baffle you. And then I'll try and bring some clarity. And once we overcome that hurdle, and if we overcome that hurdle, I'm really going to toss you into the wild waters here, into the deep end. Um, and I'm going to ask, is it possible to go even further and to say, can there be such a thing as concerns of forgetting before something happens and before it's remembered. And that's really strange. This really turns things upside down. This is memory through the looking glass, all right? Can there be, I mean, forgetting is at the end of the chain. I'm going to ask what happens at the beginning of the chain, and if we have time at the end, we'll even deal with what happens afterwards, where this, all this ends, and this relates to questions of what is worth digging out or not. So we'll think about that uh, together. So these two concepts I'm going to introduce now, pre-memory, pre-forgetting, they sound bizarre. It's terms that I'm invested in with this book. Uh, it relates to even a chapter in this book quite specifically. But let's break this down and take a very concrete example. We'll look a bit at Irish republicanism, if you wish, in its various forms. Irish republicanism is a whole martyrology, of modern political martyrology. Um, and the starting point should be with Wolf Tone. If you take, for example, uh, a classic text, which is a kind of an Ur text, of, of, of Irish republicanism, you take, for example, Speeches from the Dock. Speeches from the Dock is a 19th century book of speeches of Fenian and very uh, afterwards very na various nationalist um, people standing at the dock before their sentence is passed, and they're giving their speech from the dock, 
And it's a classic text which was recycled and republished again and again and again through the 19th century. It's the kind of thing that prepares the way for the Easter rising and afterwards is played again and again. It's a certain set of mentality. Um, a very key cultural text. And interestingly enough, of course, Features in the Dock starts with Wolf Tone. He's the father of Irish republicanism. He wasn't called that in his day. This is a much later term. It's a construct. But he's remembered as, that's his cultural memory, as the man who brings over the notion of well, the leader of the United Irishman. I'm not sure he was the leader of the United Irishman. He was a central United Irishman. There was no one single leader. And he's remembered as kind of this whole legacy and the whole martyrdom of, you can see this is a 19, late 19th century construct. So he's draped here in the colors of the French revolution and the French army uh, dying there, having committed suicide and with all the question mark about that. And then all the commemorations at Bodenstown. There's a book which just came out now by Christopher Woods um, on Bodenstown, its memory. But that's a great site of memory for Irish republicanism. And as always, it's also brought, what I call this book, something else, a decommemoration. It's also brought very violent responses from unionists and royalists at different times because it also can be infuriating for some others outside. So we'll leave that. I'm saying this is the moment, the first moment of Irish political martyrdom. Martyrs go back, of course, f further back in time. You have martyrs of the Christian church, you have concepts of martyrdom. Uh, but this is kind of a modern Republican martyrdom in its Irish configuration. All right? I'm going to ask. Theobald Wolfe Tone dies in 1798, towards the end. Very end of the year, kind of wraps the, the, the rebellion. What about this figure, William Orr? Just out of interest, is the name at all familiar to some people in the room here? Yeah. All right. Now, the reason I'm asking that is I might have assumed it would be familiar to all people, but not necessarily so. I've had people interview me about my book who have asked me, well, who is this person? So it's not necessarily, for some people it's obvious, for some people he's not known at all, for some people there's a kind of faint memory that's there, and for some people it might be part of their tradition, but they wouldn't speak about it publicly, so I'm just kind of getting a sense here. But that William Orr, in a few words, is the Republican proto-martyr. Already the word proto-martyr sets the scene here. He, he's the man before Wolf Tone. He's the warm-up act in today's, uh, kind of today's sense. Yeah, but before there's the big act, who does the warm-up act? The lesser-known band. But they prepare the scene. And William Orr is executed in 1797. So before 1798 happens, there's a Republican martyr, or somebody will be constructed as a Republican martyr, would be probably even more... Um, more precise, and that's before 1798. So as we move into 1798, you already know how they have to act and how it happens. So you already know uh, when you're going to become a martyr in 1798, you want to be remembered like William Orr. You follow a template. And this is already giving you the key to what I mean by pre-memory, that memory is already defined by certain templates, what the psychologists would call schemata, the schemes. I'll refer to that in a minute. There are certain schemes, and that's how you remember things. Things are remembered better if they fall into a certain familiar scheme. If it's foreign to that scheme, we might have to massage it and change it to make it fit to the scene, to, this, to, this, to the scheme that we have. Because there are certain patterns that we're used to, cultural patterns. So that's, that, that's in, in a nutshell. But let's look a bit closer. I'll try and explain what happens with William Orr. This is very brief. There's a very long chapter in the book on him, or a sub-chapter on him. But I can explain it there in detail with him, and I can explain it with many other characters. But let's look at him have a bit of interaction with the book itself. Um, that's his grave in Temple Patrick. We might return to that at the very, very end again. So we have the proto-martyr, executed in 1797. So Margaret, if you thought there wouldn't be any Francis Joseph Bigger, almost all the illustrations about William Moore are from Bigger's publication on William Moore. So, and of course, they're much later, 1906. Uh, these are all sketched later, so it's an attempt to create a visual memory of him much later because um, there isn't a visual memory of him from the period proper. He's executed on Three Sisters Gallows outside Carrickfergus. He's executed for swearing soldiers from the, a local unit, from offensive unit, Scottish soldiers, into the United Irishmen. This is subversive. <coughs> and this is to teach, in many ways, the Presbyterians a lesson and put them in place before the rebellion breaks out. It's to suppress the rebellion. And like many counter-revolutionary actions, it has the exact opposite response. It, in fact, infuriates people, it incites people, it gets a lot of people out, and all will be a cause which will be used again and again by the United Irishmen in 1798. In fact, the battle cry at places like Ballon Hinch and Hampshire will be Remember Poor. So his memory is playing very highly already in 1798, before there's a memory of 1798 begins. So already we're seeing how memory starts very, very early, at least with the events themselves. Now I'm going to push this a bit further back even. Orr is arrested and he's held in jail for a good year. 
we think we've invented these things, this special military act, we keep people in jail for a year without habeas corpus and without conditions because of throwing them at Guantanamo or something. Uh, that's an old game, of course. I should know well from where I come from. And in that sense, uh, he's held for a year, and then he's brought to trial. And this is, again, it's before the 1798 rebellion breaks out, and it's quite clear to people around that he's going to be executed. And if he's going to be executed, then the investment in turning, to a, in turning him into a martyr begins before he's executed. People know that if this is going to happen, this is going to be a, this is going to be a significant event. Martyrs are not just born martyrs. It's not a God-given act. It's constructed socially. There's a lot of investment into constructing a martyr. And so there's awareness of that. And William Orr is playing with this as well, meaning he's, he's invested in it as well. He wants to be remembered. He issues, before he dies, a dying declaration. So it's a statement. And he wants to read it. At his execution, it's barred, it's pre pre prevented. But it's already been smuggled out. And it's issued in multiple copies. And attempts to suppress it don't work. And it's already out there. So while he's being executed, people are already reading his dying declaration. Before he dies, he's already speaking to the future. And this will become a phenomenon of many martyrs who leave their, in today's terms, the videotape. Right, or the, the YouTube clip, but before they actually go on their act. This is not an act of suicide, I'm not saying it is, I'm saying that this is before they go on their act. And the interesting line in this whole text here, which is interesting to read in itself as a source, but that's not the purpose here, would be probably this one. I trust that all my virtuous countrymen will bear me in their kind remembrance. So he wants to be remembered. There's no point to this whole thing if he's not remembered. If he's just executed like any other common felon, then that's not the point. He trusts that his memory will be there. And to really hint on where I'm going with this, I think this works both ways. I think that he's constructing his memory, but it also shows an anxiety. He's afraid that he won't be remembered. So this is where I'm already beginning to touch slowly on what I'm going to call pre-forgetting. But he was still in pre-memory. He wants to make sure he's remembered before he's being executed, before he's on the scaffold itself. He's already thinking, how will I be remembered? What will I say which will feed into my memory? He's constructing his memory before it happens, before the event happens. There might be a last minute pardon. There was expectations even. And this whole thing is a, is a fake investment. But it's there. The material is being wait it's potentially there waiting to turn into memory. Even though history hasn't happened yet. The execution. And he's already afraid what will happen if it doesn't work out. If it fails. You know, I'm, I'm trusting you with this memory. Don't let me down. Right, so that's, that, that's the first step. And to show how people, it's a social construction, immediately the memory industry begins very, very early. The moment the execution happens, they're already preparing for it. You have all this kind of subculture, which you go and visit the Ulster Museum. You can see um, bits and pieces of it there. So you can show, see that I'm not inventing it. You can see that the, the relics are there. But you have all these kind of rosettes um, smuggled on little pieces of paper. Um, and held in people's hands, which have poems in memory of William Orr. And quite often it was a criminal offense and a dangerous effect to have on people, hid them in their shoes, hid them in their hat. I uh, would discover holding it could be executed for having such a thing. So it's very dangerous that they're carrying this memorabilia at a very early stage. The memory is starting as the event is happening at the same time. And these remember all rings, which people are holding. And if you want to see how pre-memory works, then I can show what I mean by a scenario. So Henry Joy McCracken, the leader of the rebels in Antrim town, has a remember all ring. He's in Kilmainham jail where they held all at first for a while. It kind of, they move from different places and he's holding this ring. And it's important for him, it's on his finger. It's not clear if the ring was on his finger. It probably wasn't. I think he gave it to his sister before he went to his own execution. But he's preparing for his own execution. He has this ring. So he already knows how he has to behave. He is going to be a William Orr. So already his execution and what's happening is being scripted for him. He knows in advance, a year before, that this is where it's leading to. But like, Things have been written about Patrick Pierce. Patrick Pierce, I mean, you think about it. He's also constructing his own, the, the notion of the Jeremiah Donovan Rossa funeral. He's giving a speech where he's talking about his own martyrdom while talking about previous martyrs. So there's a script being written. For those who think this is all about republicanism, uh, we won't let unionism get away with it either. But this is, we'll have to think about that. It's all around once you begin thinking about it. It's not just one community invented this game completely. Um, but this is the notion of pre-memory of these templates, of what, uh, what's called schema. The person who came up with schema was a psychologist, a British psychologist called Frederick Charles Bartlett in Cambridge in the 1930s. And he did a series of experiments, and this is personal experiments, this is not, so, this is not about collective memory, but about individual memory, where he had people tell a tale again and again and again, and looked at the different versions to see what's being remembered. So this is kind of he's inventing experimental psychology at its early stages in Cambridge. And what he notes is he gave them very curiously these kind of very remote folk tales taken from Indian tribes. 
American Indian tribes. And they tell this tale which is completely foreign to their own culture. And you slowly realize that how they quite quickly, in fact, not slowly, massage it into a tale which fits their own expectations of a story. Because the story didn't fit there. So they'd remember the story, but in a different form. Very quickly, this game of Chinese whispers turns into a localized form. So you kind of remember things in something which is familiar. You already know how to remember something. And that's the parcel of how it happens while it happens. So I'm saying there's earlier memories happening. There's memories of earlier events happening as we proceed into historical events and as we remember those events. So there's these pre-layers of memory. That's the first dance. Now, quickly, we'll move on to the next level. And I've just, we could talk for the whole time just on this. This takes quite a bit to, to chew on, doesn't it? But I'm pushing you even more. First, I was tempted. Had it been a smaller group, we'd have stopped here and started discussing events of pre-memory here. Let's push it all the way. We'll tax you a bit here. We can do that. This is one of the memory cards which comes out of time. There's a copy of this exactly in the Austin Museum. It's a memorial card to William Orr. comes out immediately uh, with his execution. Uh, it's a poem uh, about remembering uh, William Orr. It's from 1797. It's already there in 1798. Um, but let's look at these lines of what appears there. O children of Erin, when ye forget him, his wrongs, his death, his cause, the injured rights of man. Notice the word forget. Let's take another one here. May ye be debarred that liberty be sought and forgotten in the history of nations. While this memory is being constructed, this pre-memory before the event, how he's going to be remembered, it's already perforated with anxieties that it might not work out, that he might be forgotten. And this whole thing is not worthwhile. So there's anxieties of forgetting embedded in this pre-memory of an event that hasn't happened yet. Look how much investment we have in constructing memory before history happens. Now this might be picked up on history, it might be vindicated, it might not. But look at all this investment, how people are afraid that they'll be forgotten and the whole thing wasn't worthwhile. What is his death worthwhile if he's going to be forgotten? So you have to, this anxiety. Now, I don't know this anxiety works quite interestingly. This thing that I'm calling pre-forgetting is crucial for memory. In fact, it's what might ensure that memory will be remembered. The more anxiety there is, pre-forgetting paradoxically actually contributes to remembering. But it contributes to a very anxious form of remembering. A remembering that is all the time afraid of what might happen. And I can give some interesting examples here. We can think about how people are afraid. What will happen if we lose this memory? We've got to keep it on. And talk about that always anxiety is connected with memory. So there's a high level of stress here connected with what I'm saying. This will be the gist of what I wanted to present to you. There's much more that can be said. I'll just go and take it a little bit further, just so we get the full gamut and see how this plays in a long term, beyond the event itself and what's happening. And how this feeds into larger circles or expand it. It's enough if we stay with this. If you've taken this on board, we're okay, uh, but let's go a little bit further. This is just to sum things up for the moment. So historical events, this would be the thesis I presented to you here, are perceived through the pre-memory of reference to memories of previous events. And an attempt to construct those events. It's a couple of two things. So I'm saying in 1798, people are going to be executed, but they're going to have William Orr in mind as their scenario. But concerns are being forgotten often unnoticed. It takes us a new kind of study and observation. We haven't quite done that as historians properly yet. Can be raised in advance of the unraveling of historical events and their remembrance. Hence forgetting, this is the paradoxical claim, can paradoxically precede history and memory. So when I ask when does forgetting begin, it's not at the end of the chain, it's there the whole time. Forgetting has been going hand in hand with history and memory from the very beginning. And that is a challenge which we really have to think about if we want to move beyond memory and look at memory together with forgetting. And my larger argument is you can't look at memory without forgetting, and forgetting deserves just as much, if not more, attention. And the more we look at memory, forgetting, we find it's another form of remembering. All of that goes on and on. For that, you can work out. There's a 600-page book which will help you sort it out bit by bit, if you can stomach it. Um, but let's just look at this for a minute. So there's all this anxiety about remembering William Orr. And the United Irishmen are putting a lot of effort into remembering William Orr. And afterwards, Irish Republicans and Irish Nationalists will pick him up as a cause, and they'll be remember or and remember or. And I actually did an exercise in an article once. I traced every single reference to remember or throughout the long 19th century to the 20th century. Appears again and again and again, all the way through to things that you've written about, Margaret. Even in the Troubles, people kind of come up with remember or in different kinds of Republican slogan. It'll be come up in different kind of literature. So it appears in different places, all the way through into the 20th century. So you would expect with all that investment, with all be a central figure in Northern Ireland. There'd be a monument to William Orr which people go up to. But there isn't. 
William Orr is buried, which is what happens after a rebellion. You can't celebrate the, the, the dead of the rebellion. He's buried in a family grave. The name's not mentioned on the grave. The grave is the grave of Ali Orr. You don't quite know who Ali Orr was. Possibly the mother, possibly a sister. So he's in a family grave, unmarked. So this remember Orr is repeated again and again and again, and yet there's no commemoration of him, there's no monument to him. Now, people remember where it is, and there's different people going and try and discover this grave in the 19th century, early 20th century, and show them, see it's a neglect, and write how neglected it is and clean it up. It'll fall back into neglect. So with all this anxiety that we had of pre-forgetting, and I just argued before, the pre-forgetting makes sure somebody will be remembered, he'll be remembered and disremembered at the same time. So he has to be remembered, that's what pre-memory is about. Pre-forgetting is what happens if it doesn't work, but in a way, it does and it doesn't work. He's remembered in a kind of ambiguous, covered up, oblique way. And that's where I believe the cutting edge of memory studies is, is to find all these oblique memories, not the obvious monuments standing outside, which don't always have to say that much, but all these kind of oblique forms. So here, uh, here's the grave of William Moore in one case. Here's a sketch of it from other people going to look for it. So when does this end? When can forgetting come to an end and we can actually reconcile ourselves with memory? That's an interesting question. So I'm going to push this just a little bit forth, just a little bit forward. This is the last kind. This is just an addendum. This is an epilogue to what I had to say. We've already gone through the important stuff. I'm going to look a bit at commemoration. Commemoration is about public remembrance. It's about putting an end to forgetting. It's about keeping memory alive. And there's other levels at play. So look at this, for example. This is a caricature cartoon. Great to see you. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a cartoon from 1897. It's before the centenary of 1798 begins. Now, the centenary of 1798 is crucial because it's a big moment where 1798 becomes public, where monuments come out all over Ireland. In Ulster, it's a much more complicated case. It's a heavily contested event. There's a lot of rivalry. There's violence in Ulster, in Belfast, in the streets of Belfast itself. But let's look at the expectations. There's even here a pre-memory of commemoration. You can use these terms also for anniversaries. So this is an expectation in a nationalist newspaper, the Weekly Freeman, of how William Orr will be remembered, commemorated, in the upcoming centenary. And the expectation is quite interesting. I'll, I'll, figure, I'll, I'll, I'll map these figures out to you. Who we have here is Sanderson, the slide's not working for me here, and John Devlin. So we have a leader of nationalism, constitutional nationalism, meeting a unionist leader, this meeting didn't happen in these terms. I'm telling you already, it's an imagined event. A meeting together by the broken monument to William Orr to put together, to join themselves. They're not reconciling their politics, but they are united Irishmen in their memory. Their memory is bringing them together. And in the back, there's orange men, and there's nationalists, and they're holding up their plaques, and they're all standing together respectfully. They can all respect, join in the communal memory of William Orr. Now, this event will never happen. It'll be exactly the opposite of that. So pre-memory doesn't necessarily work its way out. It's an expectation. It says a lot about expectations for history. But that's how they would like him to be remembered. And the whole thing is fake from beginning to end because there isn't even a monument to William Moore. Not a broken monument. It hasn't been built. It's already being portrayed as broken before it was built. So all these levels are at play here which are paradoxical. But that's the expectation. And in a way, it already shows the anxieties of what's really going to happen. They know this is not going to happen. It's going to be the opposite. It's going to be a clash. There's not a chance in the world that it will happen, in fact. So what could have been a joint memory, doesn't work. Again, the bits and pieces of what can be recovered and do they work and can it be prescriptive, all of that is there. We'll take this a bit further. So that's 100 years. And we'll jump 200 years, just to kind of end with, with, with the last tone. And the 200 years would be, so when is he marked? When is this grave, which is Ali Orr's grave, when does his name appear? Well, the name appears in 1997, the anticipation for the bicentenary of 1998. A plaque is put in Temple Patrick, and for the first time, there's a monument to William Orr. So you can say, okay, all these anxieties are over now. We're all happy and can celebrate, especially in light of the Good Friday Agreement and all the kind of negotiations that are happening at the same time and the optimism which was at the time. It seems so far away now, doesn't it? But when it's good to remember that moment in history. Um, it is, really, especially now. We go back, and you can see William Orr is there. But even then, look at the great question mark that I put in the back. There's all these subtle levels working all the time. So is William Orr now fully remembered? It's not a plaque. Where's the monument? After all this two centuries of remember all, remember all, all these anxieties about it, all oh, the proto martyr before there was Wolf Tone, before there was Robert Emmett. The whole martyrology of Robert Emmett, kind of the darling of Erin in Irish Republicanism, is based, can be traced back to what I told you about William Moore. It's exactly taking this and perfecting it into 101 souvenirs and poems and little relics. And in then it just ends with a small plaque. 
So it's still small. There's still the anxieties of forgetting and this kind of nervousness still there. So I'm showing these dynamics don't just start before the event, they go the whole way through and they continue through. And I believe that's more or less it. We'll, we'll, we'll end with that. So that kind of gave you a, a brief line. I went a bit over the time that I wanted, but, but it gives you kind of a timeline to what I'm thinking of.